the interpersonal approach. Also, if at any point you cannot read what I write, please let me know. Um, my handwriting sucks. <laughs> but, um, so one of the key things to the interpersonal process approach in therapy is that what we are doing is we are learning how to use the relationship to provide healing for the individual. So um, when we use the word interpersonal, what we're talking about is relationship. So you can read interpersonal um, as relational. And the goal of this book is to give you guys a complete and comprehensive understanding of how to conceptualize clients, that is how to understand what they're going through, um, and how to intervene with those clients. Um, we're gonna explore how you as therapists can use the current interaction with your client um, as the vehicle for change. And that's to say we're gonna help you to see how the way you guys, you and the client, is gonna be either healing um, or perhaps a recreation of old problematic patterns. Um, so the goals here are um, to help you to identify the significant relational themes and the cognitive patterns in this person's life. So the first step is for you guys to learn what is the pattern that's happening. What are the thematic patterns that are occurring across this person's life? What is this person's life story and what are the common themes of relationship that emerge over and over? And then you are going to help the client um, to recognize how those patterns show up in their life for better or for worse. So you're gonna see, your goal is to help the client to become aware of the patterns themselves, but also to recognize what are these patterns providing and what do they cost? So for example, if I'm somebody that is dependent, which is to say that I don't have a very high self-confidence in what I can do, and I'm very reliant on other people to provide emotional security, to give me direction, the goal would be to help the client, to help the individual to recognize what are the pros of that dependency. The pros are that I never have to make a decision, right? If I'm dependent, I can just rely on you, I can rely on you, I can rely on you nonstop throughout my life. What are the cons? And so one of the cons of dependency is that you don't actually have a sense of ownership. You don't have a strong sense of self. And you are very, very vulnerable to the whips and whims and desires and needs and demands of the people around you. Um, it makes it very difficult to with, withstand the storms of other people's opinions, other people's thoughts, other people's feedback, when your whole self-concept is dependent on what somebody else is telling you to do. And so um, thirdly, we are helping the client to change those interactions in the here and now with the therapist. And this is really the key to the entire interpersonal process is that we want to use what's called immediacy interventions. And these are in interventions that take the conversation from out there with friends, with family to right here. Yes, Nick. You said helping the client change interactions. With the therapist. So you're helping the client change interactions in the here and now in the therapy session um, so that they're actually having, as, as Alex alluded to, an experience of change and not an explanation. You want the client to actually experience things being different in the therapy session than they've experienced them outside. That's really what the corrective emotional experience is, is getting at. Um, and then fourthly, the hope is that after you have help the client to change these patterns of interaction in the here and now with the therapist. The last stage of therapy is what's called generalization. So we don't do the client a lot of good if the changes that are happening are just staying in the therapeutic relationship, because that could actually increase dependency. And you'll hear people say all the time, oh, well, you have to respond that way because you're my therapist, or I know I can talk to you about it because this is a safe space. And there's a, a level, there's kind of a developmental point in therapy where that's okay. 
you know, in the beginning, right? Because we want to ha let the client have an actual experience of change in the session. But as long as it stays there and it doesn't actually change relationships outside the therapy session, the client's issues are going to remain. And what is actually going to happen is the client is going to idealize you as the therapist as this good, benevolent, generous person who can meet all their needs and provide complete security, which is not true. Um, and then they're actually going to devalue the other relationships in their life, thinking, well, they can't respond to me that way. And that actually is just another way in which this person is entrenched in the same faulty interpersonal pattern there. And so the interpersonal pattern there would actually be idealizing the therapist and devaluing other people. And that's a problematic pattern because none of us, therapists or not, are ideal, nor are we completely devoid of value. And so as soon as we shift into good guys versus bad guys in this complete way, um, we are using a pattern that protects us from the reality that life's really ambiguous and it's complicated. But at the fault of, it protects us emotionally, but the cost is that uh, we are not seeing reality as it really is. So we are morphing and distorting reality. Um, so the uh, first section here, I'm going to erase this, is that therapists, uh, new therapists struggle with um, anxiety. Who would have thought, right? Um, one of the biggest things is that what you're encouraged to do is to question your unrealistic expectations. It is normal that when you're beginning as a therapist, you don't really know much what to do and you don't have a lot of confidence in a lot. Um, there, you are on the other side of the learning curve. You're on the hard side of the learning curve where at first things are very difficult and very challenging. And only later on do they kind of come to make sense a little bit more. So the first thing is really to challenge your unrealistic expectations. Um, and one of the ways that um, Tiber talks about challenging these unrealistic expectations is to imagine, and you can all do this here and now, Imagine um, could be a therapist, could be a priest, could be a spiritual director, could be a parent, um, anybody, pardon me, in a helping role. Think about how much you admire and appreciate them. Think about how wise and knowledgeable you see them to be, how helpful they have been for you, um, how much reassurance and security or good advice or feedback they've given you. And then realize that every single one of these people was a beginner once. Each one of these people was in a place where they didn't really know what they were doing yet, where they didn't really have the tools, they didn't really have the confidence, they weren't really sure of themselves. And so what we need to do is reframe our unreasonable expectations and recognize that we are just beginners. And there's nothing wrong with being a beginner. Being a beginner is difficult. But each person that exists, every um, great, Every person of excellence, every person of virtue was once a beginner once. Um, and so we want to challenge those expectations. Uh, the second thing um, that we want to do to manage the anxiety um, is to avoid um, an excessive self-focus. Does my pen still work? So we want to avoid an excessive introverted focus, right? If we are sitting with somebody and thinking to ourselves, what am I going to say? Did I understand what they just said right? What, what should I do next? How's my posture, right? This kind of anxious perspective, this self-centered perspective, we're not actually going to be awake and alert to what the person is saying and what's happening in front of us. Um, we're gonna be consumed in ourselves. So um, secondly, and Rose, you did an uh, excellent job describing this, uh, you're going to decenter. So avoid the excessive self-focus, first of all. And secondly, you're going to decenter and focus on what the client is actually saying, rather than your own performance. Um, Therapy is not that complicated. You need to learn how to listen well. 
And in something that somebody says, there are a million different interpretations that could be made. I often tell people during sessions, because one of the things that people, especially people who are um, anxious, and especially people who are obsessive, who are very concerned with doing things the right way, or knowing what the right answer is, or not wasting time, right, being productive, people come to session, and most of the sessions that I begin, I say, where shall we begin today? It's a very open-ended question. And people experientially hate that question. Because what I'm asking is genuinely like, hey, where would you like to begin today? It's really like, where, where, where is now for you? Like, what's happening in the now? Where, where should we begin? But what they hear is, I have to perform. Or I have to pick the right answer. Or I have to say the right thing. So um, one of the things that I frequently say to people is like, there's not going to be any wasted time here. If we're, if we're in the present moment, and if we're connected to what's happening for you in the here and now, in the present moment, we're, we're never going to waste time. We could go in a million different directions. We could talk about how anxious you are about classes starting. Right? We can talk about how difficult Christmas break was for you. you know, we can talk about how difficult it is to be away from home. We can talk about the challenges with your roommate. We can talk about all these different challenges there's not going to be a wasted time or wasted space. And what gives you all confidence in actually saying that is your conceptualization of the client, which we'll talk about um, in a little bit. And that conceptualization is that you have a feeling, you have a finger on the pulse of this person's patterns of behavior. So whatever comes up, you're, gonna be, you're going to be able to see, or the goal here is to help you to learn to see how that's relevant and what to explore in it. Um, and thirdly, uh, you need to receive support. One of the most important and most valuable things that you guys can do as developing therapists is find a good supervisor. And in your early years, oftentimes you'll have to pay for supervision, right? You'll probably have to pay $100 an hour for supervision, and you'll have to do it once a week. Now, you'll probably already automatically get a supervisor in whatever placement you have. No guarantee that they're a good one invest in supervision. Um, I think there's a, a line in the um, Bible that says, when you find a wise man, wear out his doorsteps, right? So we don't want to be clingy, but finding a supervisor that you trust, that's able to direct you clinically, that you feel aligned with, um, that can help you to recognize when are you getting too involved, when are you having these unrealistic expectations, because they feel real to us in the moment is one of the most valuable things that you can do in your career. Yeah. When you said you started your therapy sessions with more questions than answers, and then you want to start to answer, um, if, they, if the client tends to like shut down after that, or like, like my guess, like, uh -huh. what would you do after? How would you resolve that? So here I would make what's called a process comment. Can anybody tell me what a process comment is? It's like when you say, how are you feeling about that? Or like checking in with the client to make sure that you guys are like on the same page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That you're seeing things in that moment. Close, close. Jean Paul? Exactly, that's it. And so it can include a lot of the things that you just said, like feelings. But what a process comment is, it's an immediacy intervention, which means it's an intervention that refers to the present moment, the here and now. And it brings attention not to what's being talked about, but to how the person is interacting. So in that situation, if I asked that question, what I would recognize is that I'm activating a problematic scheme. This question activated a problematic schema for this person. Perhaps it's a um, paralysis, options paralysis, right? So many different, different, different things, what, sh what should I talk about? But what I would do is try to make what's subliminal, make what's not being said, make what's going under the surface, make what's um, implicit that's happening here explicit. Because if we don't talk, if we don't name it, we can't talk about it. And if we don't talk about it, then we can't recognize what effect it's having in the interactions at the current moment. So I would say something like, hey, Nick, I asked you this question, you know, where should we begin today? And I noticed right afterwards that you, you kind of shut down, you kind of pull back a little bit. I was just wondering, what happened for you when you heard that question? And then we would explore in the here and now. And what you're doing is you're bringing relevance in the here and now. I'm saying like, hey, 
this is a we. It's not a you and it's not a me. This is a we learning to work together. And what I want to do is, is break the normal social rigidity and social expectations and say, hey, what we can do here is we can actually talk about what's going on in the relationship in a way that's helpful, too. Many people will find it threatening because when the things that are talked about in the relationship come up, it's done so in an abra abrasive, a abrasive and aggressive matter. Um, so you want to, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and so um, give yourself the gift of the investment in a supervisor because um, especially in your early years, find a good supervisor. Find a good supervisor, even if it's just once a month, find a good supervisor because they'll be able to ground you. They'll be able to help you manage your expectations. Um, and essentially what a supervisor is really good at is like meta therapy, right? It's helping therapists be better therapists. But um, in addition to a supervisor, I really suggest that you all um, do therapy as well. Um, if you guys all are serious about um, being a therapist, I think my number one recommendation for you guys right now is to get into therapy. And if you think that you don't need therapy, you probably shouldn't become a therapist <laughs> um, because we, we all have areas of ourselves that we're either unwilling or unprepared or unknowledgeable about. Um, and if you don't identify them, they will come up in session. Um, so therapists are more effective. I think I might have just misspelled therapist. Um, with a treatment focus. And your treatment focus um, is the unifying vein that goes through all of your work together. So what you're going to do is as soon as you start interacting with a client in the first session, on the first phone call, the way they're emailing you, the way they're reaching out to you, you are going to begin developing a case formulization or a case conceptualization. And that's, that's really the key. That's a word that I refer to most often is the case conceptualization. Um, and what a case conceptualization, conceptualization is, is it helps you to conceptualize or discern what the core problem really is. Oftentimes, a client will come in and maybe tell you, um, I'm having a really hard time in school. Right? My grades aren't, aren't really where they should be. You don't know what the core problem is. Because maybe the problem is that they have a difficulty with attention and they can't do their coursework. Maybe their problem is that um, they're so focused on coursework that they're not able to, they, their standards are so high um, that they can't turn in anything less than perfect. So they tend to procrastinate and then drive themselves up a wall and not turn in anything because they're so overwhelmed and anxious. Maybe their problem is that they actually are doing pretty decent. Maybe, Maybe they're not a 100% student every time. Maybe they're a BC student, and that's fine. That's OK. But their parental expectations, the expectations of their parents are, if you don't have an A, if you're not the smartest person in the room, if you're not the smartest sibling, then our love for you deteriorates. right? So in your case conceptualization, you are identifying what the client's problem really is. Oftentimes, that's hidden and doesn't come out for a little while. You're understanding how it came about developmentally. So how has this problem emerged over years in interactive patterns? Um, and then how this client's problem is um, playing out and causing symptoms in the client's daily life. Um, how is this problem showing up not just in school, but across contexts? One of the contexts. One of the things that you guys will grow to appreciate is that our relationship patterns are not random. We don't have, say you know 150 different people. There's a sense in which we can appropriately say that you don't have 150 different relationships with people, right? We categorize people. Friends, enemies, family, best friends, um, whatever it is. And so the more we are acting out of defensiveness, the less we're interacting with a real person and the more we're using these kind of ideas of who they are,
to keep our life really simple. Um, and so what we want to learn is how does this person repeatedly interact with people? How does that cause problems with their peers? How does it cause problems with their parents, authority figures, um, friends, neighbors, whatever it might be? Um, and one of the things that's interesting is that um, the core conditions of therapy, these are like the Rogerian conditions, right? Empathy, positive regard, warmth, um, congruence, those are necessary. You, you have to have those if you're going to be a therapist. But they're not sufficient. They're not enough. And um, in the book, it talks about how a theorist says that, you know, oftentimes therapy is kind of described as a nice, like, warm bath. It's safe, it feels good, um, but what happens when it's just kind of safe and it just feels good and it's just warm is that you don't go anywhere and nothing changes if nothing changes. And so what therapy is more appropriately to be conceptualized or thought about is like a crisp, cool lake, like water in a lake, right? It's not always as, as pleasant. It doesn't always feel as good but it helps us see things. It helps us come to our senses. It helps us to see the world, reality, and ourselves more accurately. Um, and so one of the things that's also very interesting about the clinical literature is that each theory, right, CBT, um, REBT, um, EFT, DBT, they love the three-letter acronym, or three-letter Acronyms, whatever, that's not really an acronym, whatever they call it. They love to describe therapies of three letters. They all make an argument, psychoanalysis, they all make an, an, an argument that, oh, our therapy is better than the other ones. And we can show it in this clinical trial and in that clinical trial. And there's, there is something to be said about certain therapies are tailored to specific conditions. But what's clear across all the literature is that it's not actually the therapeutic orientation that leads to change in clients. It's the therapist themselves. So the therapeutic factors are far, far more important than the orientation that you choose. And so you could take this interpersonal process approach and you could be a CBT therapist. You could be a psychodynamic therapist or a gestalt therapist or a person-centered therapist. But if you're not tuned into the what is happening in our interaction right now, you're not going to make much change. Um, so the key is to have a treatment focus where you know what am I doing and why am I doing it. Um, and so here we have the, the three core concepts um, of this book. And you guys will see this over and over and over um, throughout the various chapters. Um, and they are the process dimension, the corrective emotional experience, and client response specificity. Also, if I spell a very obvious word, um, like dimension, you can point it out. Um, Okay, so the process dimension. This is probably one of my absolutely favorite concepts um, in therapy. Um, the process dimension refers to how the client and the therapist are interacting. The distinction here um, is between um, the process and the content. The content of a conversation is what is being said. What are the words that are being exchanged? What is the topic that's being discussed? But the process is how are these two individuals interacting? Um, to my chagrin, the best example of this is probably 
me on the way home from basketball practice uh, when I was a teenager. And so I would get home from basketball, or my mom would pick me up from basketball practice, um, and I'm worn out. I'd probably just been berated for about two hours straight um, and berated myself and physically exhausted. Um, and I'd get in the car, and what would my mom say? Yeah, how was practice, right? And what would I say? Fine. <laughs> Fine, Mom. Right? My mom's, at, my mom's coming in, and she's saying, like, where should we be? Like, right, my mom's, what my mom's process is, is I want to connect with you. I want to I hear about your practice. Like, how was it, right? My mom asked me, like, how was it? I say, fine. Oh, tell me about it. I don't want to talk about it, right? What is happening in the interaction there between my mom and I? Resistance. Yeah, describe that a little bit. Like, what's, to put a little bit more meat on the bones. What's, what's happening in our interaction? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're projecting stuff that didn't actually have anything to do with her. Oh. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, there probably certainly is. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> those are all true, right? There's different ways to analyze it, but at the core of the message there is I want to talk. I don't want to talk, right? We call that resistance, right? The process there is not being said. Now, maybe I said, oh, I don't want to talk about it. But then my mom goes, oh, well, I just want to, I just want to like, hear like, how it was. Or what more likely usually happened is then my mom is just kind of like, okay. You know, and I'm just kind of there like a freaking ogre, <laughs> right? And I'm mad at my mom, and I'm mad at my coach, and I'm mad at myself, and exhausted. Um, and so if you could make a process comment there, If you were my mom and you could make a process comment there, a comment that would bring explicitly the interaction that's happening implicitly, what would you say? Yeah, yeah. That would be a pretty, yeah, that'd be a pretty mom thing. To, that'd be a pretty like gold star mom thing to say. <laughs> Right. What's another? What's another example of another process comment? Yeah. 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 That'd be a good one. That'd be a good one. Yeah. Yeah, excellent, yeah. The most difficult thing for mom to do in that situation is to step out of the content. The content for mom even, even though it's kind of processy, right, because moms live in process, even though it's kind of processy, what's going on is mom's trying to, to, to reach out and I'm, I'm kind of saying no, that's, that's the process. The content is, how was your day? I don't want to talk about it, right? That's the content. The content is the words that are being spoken. But another way that situation could, in, could go is I could come in after basketball practice and my mom could say, like, hey, how was your day? And I could go, you know, mom, I don't really want to talk about it. If that's okay, I'd like to just drive home in silence. If you're listening to Caleb. Not really, <laughs> but, you know. Um, now, in that situation, right, the content, the what is being said actually matches the process that's occurring. And so another perhaps process comment that could be made, if, I would, if that was happening, right, or I was, doing, I was working with a um, teenager who's resistant, as they frequently are, um, because they're being constantly told what to do and how to act, and why wouldn't you put up walls if everybody's trying to invade your space and tell you how to be a human being? Um, or you just get driven around and physically and emotionally. And um, Probably a comment that I would make is something like, um, yeah, I can tell that you really don't want to talk right now. This feels like a really hostile space. And if there's something that I said that upset you, I'd love to hear about it. But if you just don't want to talk much right now, that's okay too. Right? So you, all you're doing with the process comment, and this is one of the most important, 
effective things as you can do as a therapist is bringing to light what's happening in the here and now. Um, it's less about what the client is saying and more about how the um, person is interacting with each other. When you're in a session and you don't know what's happening and you're talking about something, you've lost the process. And this is what happens usually for us therapists, especially early on. We get caught up in the content. You know, we get caught up in the content. Somebody says something, but, oh, blah, 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 blah. Or we get really scared. Somebody says something like, oh, what happened? What, you know? And then we lose the actual pattern of interaction, right? Um, so what the use of process comments does um, is it, it uncovers the implicit and allows us to talk about things like misunderstandings. It allows us to resolve them, to fix, fix them, to work through them. It gives us the opportunity to bring more intensity into the therapeutic relationship in the here and now in a way that's actually functional and in a way that actually gr brings an increased security with the confidence that like, hey, if something goes wrong, we can just talk about it. And the key here um, is to be non-defensive, right? And if mom responded by saying, oh, I'm just trying to ask about your day, there's that defensiveness, that's just, we are working, we are, um, we are engaging in an interpersonal pro process that is non-functional. Because one person has one agenda, the other person has the other agenda, and it's either going to stay gridlocked or escalate until something changes. So what we're doing here is we are stepping um, beyond the normal social roles. And the most functional thing that you can do with a process comment is link the thing that the client is talking about to the way that you're interacting here and now. So if a client comes in and they're saying, yeah, my, mom, my mom's just controlling me. She's trying to control me all the time. I don't really like that. I don't really like being controlled. The process comment that I could make there would be to say something like, well, you know, I don't really like being controlled either. It might be easy for us here, since I'm a therapist and you're a teen, to get set up in that same power hierarchy where you might be feeling controlled by me. I'm wondering if you felt controlled by me at all today in session so far. And maybe they say, no, not at all. Actually, I think you know, you're really nice. Or maybe they say, like, I mean, you are an adult, so you're just going to tell me what to do. And what that does is it reveals something that no matter what, it's going to inter interfere with the way you guys are interacting. Yeah. Why we want to avoid why questions. Why questions send people into an existential depth of which there is no answers because there's a million answers and they don't know why. What and how questions are really effective. So how might I know? How could you tell me if I if you felt I was controlling you? What is it like when you feel controlled by your mom? What shows up? in your body when you see somebody that you think is controlling? Um, how can we make sure that doesn't happen here? So why questions we really want to avoid, but what and how questions are very, very effective. So you certainly, the, the intention of exploring more background, that's exactly what it is. Because that's an entry point. And that's what process comments do, is process comments create big old gates for you to go to the core of the issue. And where we're in the process dimension, we can get to the, because we have the um, conceptualization, we can get to the core of the issue like that. Yeah. Uh, was there another question? No. Um, one of the things that's key here is that, um, what are we on, E? The key is that we are genuinely trying to explore. We are not trying to be forceful. We're genuinely approaching this person with an interest, with a curiosity, and we're trying to create a collaborative exploration of the here and now. Anxiety and, and curiosity cannot really coexist in an individual's experience. If, if curiosity is here, it's bigger than the anxiety, right? The only way they can really truly coexist is when the 
curiosity holds the anxiety. So if we can help somebody to shift from I'm feeling frustrated to, yeah, let's, let's see if we can understand a little bit more about what that frustration is about. All of a sudden, that anxiety is now enveloped in a place that you can actually explore from. And you can try this with yourself. When you're feeling, cur when you're feeling anxious about anything, if you can just start asking yourself, not why am I doing this? Why do I always feel this way? But if you can ask yourself those how questions, how am I feeling right now? How am I experiencing this stress showing up in my body? How am I interacting with other people? That welcomes a stance from which we can pretty much go anywhere. It creates a, a space of safety. Um, and so, yeah, the key is that we are um, kind of going beyond the everyday language, the everyday interaction. It's hard and it's uncomfortable at first, but it's uh, magical as well. Yeah. So I guess I'm just curious, when would it be like inappropriate to use a process? Never. <laughs> you could probably offer inappropriate process comments or process comments that are um, ill-intended process comments. Oftentimes, the, some of the most hurtful things that happen to us are process comments. Like, um, you've let me down again, right? That is a process comment that somebody might say to someone who feels frequently let down by someone, but those things sting. You know, so most of the time when we're exposed to process comments, they happen spontaneously, um, but in hurtful, painful ways. Because usually we shy away from talking about what's happening between me and you until we get really mad or angry. Um, women make process comments far, 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 more normally than men. Um, it's not really all that frequent or normal for God to be like, hey man, I just really liked you. Like, you're, like I'm really glad we're friends. You know, now that can happen, but um, it's much more frequent for a guy to be like, dude, you're an idiot, but we always have such a great time, right? But that's like something totally different where it's more normal right, for, for, for women to interact in a way that's actually talking about the relationship in the here and now. Um, if you are making a process comment because you are feeling out of control, and I've done this, unfortunately, more times than I can count, because this is what I usually do um, when I'm feeling unsafe in, or when I'm feeling overwhelmed in a therapy session, is I find it pretty easy to be tuned into the process, right? So I could say something like, maybe a client, I can tell a client is actually starting to feel scared of what's happening right now, not because of the way we're interacting, but because they're used to this experience where when I talk about emotional things, people, you know, jump on me or people punish my vulnerability or people crush my vulnerability. Um, and so if somebody's talking about something emotionally and I notice them withdrawing, the attitude in which I deliver the process comment is of the utmost consequence. If I'm being accurate to the process, I might say something like, man, it feels like you're going away right now. You were telling me about this emotional thing, but all of a sudden it feels like there's this huge distance between us, right? And that's an authentic process comment of wanting to explore. I could also probably say, you know, every time we've talked about emotions, you disappear and it's like, I don't know why you do that, right? So I could, I could deliver a process comment it's the attitude with which we deliver the process comment. One process could be I'm genuinely trying to um, bring to awareness and attention the interaction. The other process that might be happening in me making a process comment, the meta-meta process, is I'm feeling out of control and I'm trying to grab onto it vis-a-vis -a, -vis a process comment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Um, this is why we need to take care of our own stuff. Um, any other questions on, we will go through, this is kind of the course, so we'll go through all these things in, in much greater depth. Um, I really like the process, if you guys can't tell. Um, so we could talk about it for days, and we will actually <laughs> probably talk about it for weeks. Uh, the corrective emotional experience. The corrective emotional experience is one of the other core aspects of um, the interaction between client and therapist. And um, 
it's facilitated um, in the interaction. What it is is when people come into therapy, they will have expectations about how people respond to them, right? For example, the kid that thought everybody was trying to control him. That's a reasonable expectation that somebody might have. The corrective emotional experience is when I respond in a way that's authentic, that's appropriate, and that's accurate, that disconfirms their expectations for how I might respond. So if this individual comes into a therapy session and they expect that me, the therapist, is going to control them because I'm an adult and an authority figure, and I actually respond in a way that's collaborative, that says, hey, I want to work on this together. Hey, I actually don't want to control you. Let's be a team so we can identify when you feeling controlled happens so that we can stop that and figure out a new way to interact. It's a corrective emotional experience because what they're expecting is the same old problematic pattern, but the way I respond is a new, a new pattern that's more helpful. And that's really the key of the corrective emotional experience is when we are able to respond to clients in new and more helpful ways that enable them to work through, address, and resolve aspects of their core issue. And so um, we want to provide a new and more satisfying response to, let's see, we want to provide a new and more satisfying response to the client's old relationship patterns. And the key here is that when the client is exhibiting the same relational patterns that originally brought them into treatment, for example, being overly compliant, being overly dependent, being counter-dependent, that's to say not wanting to be controlled, or being rejecting of control, um, being aggressive, when the individual is enacting the patterns that initially brought them into treatment, our goal is to resolve the conflict and change the pattern within the therapeutic relationship. And so if we aren't able to do that, therapy fails. Now, one of the most helpful questions here to ask is, am I co-creating a new and reparative relationship or Am I just replaying the old and problematic relational pattern? It's one of the best questions you can ask yourself. Am I creating a new helpful relationship? Or am I just continuing the old song and dance that's problematic that this person has experienced? The reason therapies often fail is because the same pattern happens, right? So I've, I've heard people over the years who have asked me things like, oh, what do you think of like Rogerian therapy? which is very non-directive therapy. The idea with Rogerian therapy is that like warm bath. You provide empathy, you provide unconditional pos positive regard, and the belief is that if in that context, people will self-correct. People say, what do, you, what do you think about you know, Rogerian therapy? And I give my two tidbits, but usually I'm wondering, what do you think about Rogerian therapy? Because that's what people are really you know, um, wanting to say. And oftentimes, I, I remember somebody in specifically said, I just don't like it. The therapist just kind of sits there and, and doesn't, doesn't do much, doesn't say much, doesn't really help you. That person probably had a pattern of people being passive and not stepping into a role to helping them. And so when they went to therapy, that therapist, even though out of good intentions and care, just repeated the same pattern, right? Now there's other therapists who might say, oh, that therapist was too controlling. So this is why we need to be, and we're gonna talk about it um, in a moment, um, client specific. Um, we're responding in new and helpful way to old patterns. And this is the key, um, Alex, you were talking about. And this is probably one of the most, I probably have said that a lot of times, one of the most important things. We want to give people an experience and not an explanation. We have to, if we want to help people to heal, we have to give them an experience and not an explanation. Because an, ex an explanation comes from sitting on the outside, looking in. And what we have to do to help people change and to heal is step in with them on the inside. 
and to not give them an experience of a benevolent, all-powerful therapist who can help them get through anything, because that's not real. But to give them an experience of a good, caring, fallible individual who's willing to show up, who's willing to be there with them, who's willing to go with them to the dark places that they're afraid to go, who's willing to work through confusion and miscommunications, that experience is something that really changes us. Because when we disconfirm our old faulty assumptions of the patterns, our own faulty sets of frame, we open up space for new patterns of relating. And oh my gosh, if I could have this new experience with this therapist, I didn't think anybody could respond to me that way. Because all of my life I thought, nobody cares about me. But oh my gosh, if one person cares about me, who knows, maybe in a world of 8 billion, there's another. Could be. I think the odds are in my favor. But what we do is so easily, and I do this all the time, every day, it's probably one of my weaknesses as a therapist, is we slip into the armchair. And we say, oh, yeah, and we just say the conceptualization. Now, that can actually be really helpful for people to know. But if we're just explaining, 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 nothing's changing. All these people are getting is, a, is more drawings to the narrative of their life. There's, there's not a new narrative that's created. So we want to give the experience of a co-creation of a new narrative, a co-authoring, a co-writing. Um, and when that happens, that's when things change. There was an individual that I was working with early on um, in first year of our work together. And I was just learning about this stuff. And um, he came in because he was depressed um, and anxious. And um, he had issues with his parents. And um, for a while, things weren't changing at all. I was giving him the mindfulness practices, right? I was giving him the empathy. I was doing all, I mean, I was doing everything in my power to try to help this person, really. And I was, I was trying to be really thoughtful about the case. And um, one day they came in and they were feeling kind of frustrated. But they didn't say it. But I could kind of see it because they were just talking about like what they were doing was they were saying, oh, I'm still depressed and I guess I'm not doing anything, doing things enough and I've been doing therapy for a while and my sense was that, okay, there's a little bit of frustration here. It's being directed towards themselves because that's the pattern that they learn to protect themselves. Turn it inward, which is what depression is. Um, when we take all the negativity and instead of ascribing responsibility, we take responsibility for ourselves because it's safer to do that than hold our, you know, uh, the people around us responsible. And, you know, I said to him, I said, you know, as you're talking about it, as you talk about the work that we've been doing, I think I kind of realized that because I actually had just read this chapter. <laughs> and uh, so I said, you know, I think I've probably been giving you like a pretty good explanation of what's going on in your life and all these problems, but nothing really is changing. And I don't know if this, like the experience here, I don't know if we've actually been on the ball with where we need to be to help you. And I'm sorry. Like I, I, I realize that I think I've been giving you a lot of interpretations, things that sound helpful and maybe feel helpful in the moment, but things that haven't actually moved the needle at all. Um, and I said, I said, you know, I'm wondering if you were feeling any frustration with me, right? That's a process comment, right? Because I'm trying to bring, now that was a process comment that was kind of exploratory because I didn't know if that was happening or not, but that's most of the time what process comments are. They're, they're tentative. They're not rock solid until they are, <laughs> but because you know the person well enough and even then they're still tentative, but we, they, they kind of said, yeah, I'm, I, I am kind of feeling a little frustrated. It hasn't really been working, I've been showing up, I've been doing the stuff, and um, the next week they came in and all their depressive symptoms were gone. And they went from like a, uh, a 17 on the PHQ-9, which is uh, um, analysis of depression, and cutoff score is five, to like a five, which is like within the range of minimal depressive symptoms. And I was like, what the hell happened? <laughs> you know, and I was kind of doubtful too. I was like, okay, like, Whatever, something changed, but it wasn't really significant. Like, this isn't really that big of a deal. Whatever. I was like, I just asked him. I was like, hey, what happened? Like, you're feeling a lot better. And they said, they said, I've never had someone apologize to me in my life. They said, I've, I've never 
I've never had somebody that could admit that like they fell short. And so um, it brings tears to my eyes because it's so sad. Right? Like that's a really sad thing. But um, and I'm sure there were people who had apologized, but maybe not the significant people, and maybe not enough. Um, but that didn't that didn't that change didn't float away. We kept working together for a couple couple more weeks, and that that change was actually sustained. Her she was still mildly depressed, but went from like severe depression to like functioning with minimal symptoms. Um, and we kept seeing each other for a couple weeks, and then we went to once a month for a couple months, and then we said like, hey, like, I think the work work here is done. And so like that's the power of a corrective emotional experience, and that's the importance of us not being on our armchairs. Um, and us being unapologetically human um, and humble with ourselves um, to change those expectations that we don't have to be perfect and we can't be perfect, um, but rather we're always just beginners. Um, but when we have the courage to say what's actually happening, like things change. Um, and so we can give our clients that gift of, of the corrective emotional experience. Um, let's pick up, um, we'll, we'll have a couple questions here that you guys might have or reflections, um, but we will pick up finishing up client response specificity. Um, so whoever is, um, up for Thursday, uh, for presenting that we will have presentations, um, on Thursday, um, Anything after corrective emotional experience is on the table. So I think that begins with counter-transference issues and fears of making mistakes. Um, but yeah, I'm wondering just before we finally wrap up, if anybody has thoughts, comments, reflections, um, yeah, any questions from anything that we've covered today? Yeah. Say that one more time. I'm wondering if you can give a process knowledge that is predicated on the Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So this happens to me all the time when I'm when I'm feeling out of control in the session and I don't know where we're going. And I might I might make a process comment that's actually accurate. And I might say, it feels like you're reacting to me the way that you react to your dad. That process comment might be actually accurate to the interaction, but it's not emotionally attuned. Because it is accurately describing the interaction, but where it misses is that you're not actually plugged into what the client needs, you're plugged into your own needs, and your need to secure safety um, is being prioritized over the client's, over your need to provide the client with a safe haven. Yeah, cool. Any other final questions? Cool, we will pick up on Thursday. Yeah. I was wondering if you hadn't had, if you didn't think about the importance of having a good